With 80,000 plus new IRS agents coming into play over the coming years, there is no doubt our chance of getting audited is going to dramatically increase. which is exactly why you need to watch this video because I'm about to go over 15 tips and techniques to help you avoid an audit altogether. And if you were to be audited, you'll be so much better prepared once you know this information. Hello, if you're brand new to the channel, my name is Mike Kelly. I'm a CPA here in Modesto, California, where I run my own accounting practice. And on this YouTube channel, I help people master business, money, and taxes. Best defense we have against an audit is to keep the spotlight off of us at all times. If the IRS doesn't see any issues with us, there's gonna be no reason for them to audit us because the IRS is kind of like the Eye of Sauron from Lord of the Rings. It's constantly searching for its new victim. But if we don't give it a reason to pay attention to us, we might escape an audit altogether. I see. So what's the very first thing and one of the most effective things we can do to not have the IRS pay attention to us? Believe it or not, it's actually filing a tax return. Yes, it's that simple. If we don't file a tax return, we dramatically increase our chance of getting audited by the IRS if we were supposed to file, especially in the event where we might owe taxes. The IRS receives the copies of documents like W-2s, 1099s, broker statements, and other things throughout the year, and their computer systems can quickly generate if we may owe tax. But if we don't file anything and we don't report anything, they're gonna have a, a much greater reason to think they can get more taxes from us and start sending us notices and potentially even audit us if we're not being compliant. Therefore, what we wanna do is file our return by the due date. And by due date, I mean either 415 or the extended due date of October 15th. It's 100% okay to extend your tax return. Let me say that again because people don't believe me, but it's completely okay to extend your tax return. As long as you file your return by the extension date, there's gonna be no issues. In fact, one reason you may want to extend is to have more time to, in order to prepare the return correctly. Number two, accompanying the idea of filing re your return on time, the only thing you need to do for sure by April 15th is make sure you pay whatever you believe your tax owed is by April 15th. We can extend our time to file, but we cannot extend our time to pay. But if we pay our taxes timely, once again, they're gonna have their money, they're gonna see our tax return filed, much less chance of them having any issues with us. In the event you think you're gonna owe an absorbent amount of money and you don't think you can pay everything and by the 15th, that's actually okay. There's no reason to stress. You can actually get an installment agreement with the IRS. I have a video on this topic. I'll post it in the comment, or not the comments, but the description section below. Get a payment plan in place with the IRS if you cannot pay your your taxes owed and as long as you're working with them they are going to work with you and once again you're going to dramatically decrease your chance of being selected for audit the third thing to be doing is if you receive a tax notice from the irs not a problem it's okay notices are common but if you do receive a notice from the irs or whomever make sure you respond timely when you receive that notice it will tell you that they want a response by a certain date or they might think you owe a balance whatever it may be but at least respond to them by that date or before that date. If you're, like I said, if you're engaging with them, if you're corresponding with them, there's less chance of issues arising with you later on. But the more you put them off, the more you neglect them, they, the more they become crazy, like your crazy ex-girlfriend who's gonna stalk you and hunt you down because you won't pay attention to her. Girlfriend, girlfriend, I will be your girlfriend. I will be your girlfriend. I will be your girlfriend. So don't let the IRS become your crazy ex-girlfriend. Pay attention to them. Give them what they need and they'll be on their way and out of your life. Number four actually deals with 1099s and this is something they're gonna be looking a lot closer at. With the gig economy, the IRS saw that a lot of people weren't properly reporting their income and this is something they're gonna be really focused in on. So 1099s, what am I talking about? It's this statement right here. If you have a business, whether you're a sole proprietor or own a corporation or you know whatever it may be, or if you have a farm, or if you have rental properties and you're paying somebody for labor, if they're an independent contractor, and I'm not talking, 
I'm not talking about somebody who's an employee for you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who just works for themselves, who is not incorporated, who is not incorporated. And if you if you pay them more than six hundred dollars in during the course of a year, you are required to issue them a form called a 1099 and they are going to report that and they're supposed to report that income on their tax return that allows you by by you filing that form it allows you to report your payment to them as a deduction on your return they report it as income you report it as a deduction on your return if the irs sees that you have not filed your 1099s a bunch of bad things can happen to you number one is that first of all they can say well we see you haven't been filing 1099s and there's substantial and severe penalties for not doing so. It's very costly and it's typically per form that you haven't filed because uh, some people have to file more than one 1099, just depends. But there's penalties that can accrue on the 1099 itself. And then from a personal tax standpoint, also, if they see you have not filed these forms, they can actually audit you and see that, oh, you didn't file those 1099s. Well, we're not going to allow you all those deductions for what you paid them. Yes, that's right. That's what they can do. So look at getting those 1099s filed timely and look at the 1099 instructions on the IRS website to see how it works. And if you need help, I have bookkeepers and professionals who can I can put you in touch with who can help you with such matters. Number five is a very common tip to avoid audits, but most people I see are still trying to do this. And that is if you're a business owner, especially if you're a business owner, don't get in the habit of reporting even numbers if it's not the real number. What do I mean? If they're driving around for business, doing their jobs, and they didn't track their miles, let's say, around the end of the year, it's time to do their taxes, and they list, oh, I think I drove 12,000 miles, or about 12,000 miles. So on their tax return, they wrote 12,000 miles as a deduction. What is the likelihood that they actually drove exactly 12,000 miles? is not very likely. It's much more likely if they were keeping records that they drove 12,147 miles or some other number. But the chance that it's exactly 12,000, wh what does it look like? It looks like, to the IRS, it looks like they pulled that number out of thin air and put it on paper because that's probably what they did and that's what a lot of people do. And so by doing that, you show the IRS that, oh, hey, Look, this person's using all these even amounts. It's probably not the real amount. So maybe I should audit them and see if I can, if they actually have records for this. And if they don't, we're gonna disallow the deduction and create some headaches for them. And that's what they'll do. And so get in the habit of keeping good records, which we're gonna talk about next, and try to avoid using even numbers unless it truly is the right number. Speaking about having good records, let's talk about it. So the IRS, if you're sitting in front of an auditor, and they're asking you questions about your records. I'm just gonna let you know right now, your words, your explanations, it doesn't matter to them. They don't care what you have to say. Do you realize how much people lie to them? And so they could care less about your explanation for the most part, they could, they could care less. What they wanna see is they wanna see records. And by records, what do I mean? Well. I'm going to do a separate video on this, so stay tuned. Be subscribed to the channel so you don't miss it because I'm, I feel like it's a really important video. I'm going to make this video soon and to show people how to keep good records. But essentially, what they want to see, if the IRS is auditing you, because I've been a part of an audit before, so I know what they look for. They want to see, they're going to look at your tax return and they're going to ask to see your financials and they might point out certain expenses or certain particular transactions. And they want to see where do you have the receipts for those and the flow of that, those amounts from the receipts through the bank statements to your financials and to the tax return. So let me, let me back that up. So you want to have receipts, keep your receipts for everything you can, if, especially if it's for business, it's okay. If it's not in paper, it can be digital. Digital is totally fine. That's acceptable, but just either have a paper copy or have a digital copy of that receipt and maybe even have some notes on that receipt, depending upon what it is, but you should have the receipt. You should, they should be able to see that transaction on your credit card or bank statement, right? So from the receipt to the credit card or bank statement, and then from the bank statements, you can see how that information flows to your financials. And then finally, the from the financials to the tax return and that's how it all ties back to 
together. If you have those records, huh, you're in great shape, no issues. If you don't have those records, guess what? If they see that you don't have one thing, they're gonna keep digging further and further and further until they assess a potential penalty and back back due taxes because you don't have the records to back up your numbers. So documentation and record keeping is the safest thing you can do to win an audit. But more than anything you can do, if having good records is the king, it is the top of the top. If you have that, you're golden. Without that, you're pretty screwed. Number seven is reporting excessive losses. But can't we deduct losses? Yeah, absolutely, you can deduct losses. But let's say you, you were trying to run a business, but every year you're, you're reporting larger and larger losses, or you have not had a year where you've had any profit. Well, what happens, and it's okay to report a loss for a couple of years, it's totally fine. But if you keep reporting a loss after loss, after loss, after loss, year after year after year, get my drift, then the IRS is gonna to start to notice that. They're gonna like, wait a minute, maybe that's not a business that this person has, maybe that's a hobby. Because with an actual business, they wanna see at least a profit at least two out of five years, at least two out of five. And there's some exceptions to that, I'm not gonna go into it in this video, but you wanna demonstrate that you're making a profit. So to keep, if you find yourself continually losing money, you might actually purposely limit some of your deductions to avoid an audit. And to, or, or maybe you show a little bit of profit just to kind of keep them off your back. Now, because what will happen is if they deem your business a hobby and you can look into the hobby loss rules to see what I'm talking about, what they'll do is they'll, let's say, let's say it's, you know, you're doing your 2021 taxes or 2022 taxes and you're about to show a loss. If they determine at that point that your business is a hobby, they're not gonna just stop at 2021 or 2022. Oh no, they're actually gonna go back several years. And let's say in the previous years, you deducted $10,000 of losses, 15,000, 20,000, whatever it may be. So all these years of consecutive losses, right? Well, they might just say, well, we're, because your business is actually a hobby as of right now, we're gonna go back and we're going to disallow all those deductions that you took years ago. And now we're gonna make you pay tax plus interest plus penalties on that balance. Ah! So you can see that if you constantly show excessive losses, be careful because you are putting a big bright red target on your back and you might not be realizing. Number eight, it's a really simple thing you can do. If you feel that you're reporting something that's a little you know, unique or a little bit out of the ordinary, you take your tax software and TurboTax should have this. I'm not a TurboTax expert, but find a spot where you can insert a statement and, and you know put some extra descriptions in to your tax return to explain what you're doing or what you're trying to do. The more information you can present, the clearer it might be for the Internal Revenue Service when they're looking over your tax return. Number nine, one of the most highly audited forms in existence is Schedule C. That's right, if you're trying to be a sole proprietor, you got a side hustle, you got a, maybe you got a YouTube channel, you know, the, the, the Schedule C can come in various forms of various kinds of businesses. Unfortunately, the Schedule C is a business they look at very closely because there's a lot of errors for people reporting Schedule Cs because a lot of people, like I just mentioned a moment ago, is kind of running it like a hobby. And so if you have a Schedule C, consider, really consider, finding a business attorney to help you form an actual legal entity. Believe it or not, if you form an LLC, a limited partnership or partnership or corporation or S corporation, your chances of being audited go down dramatically. Now, of course, it costs more money to set up an entity structure like that, and that's gonna be a separate tax filing, for the, or maybe a separate tax filing, depending upon the circumstances. But if you have a formal legal business entity that is separate from you, it makes you look way more professional, and it make, to, especially to the, not only to your customers, but to the IRS, and it, it gives them the idea that you know, you're really trying to get your stuff together and that they're they're gonna expect to see much higher quality records. Find an attorney you feel comfortable with and work with them to get that set up. Number 10, now this one should be obvious, but a lot of people will find themselves in the situation is do not mix business with pleasure. Do not mix 
business with personal matters is what I'm trying to say. And I've made a video on this about why it's so important to have a separate bank account for your business transactions, separate from your personal account. Well, the accounting advantages are absolutely tremendous. You know, you can't even put a price tag on how much time it will save you and how much more professionally you appear to the IRS or just to, in general, if you have all of your business transactions separate from you personally. And if the IRS can see that, it's gonna help. Now, if you have your transactions very commingled, it makes things look messy. And the messier they look, the harder it is for you to keep good records and clean records, and the more likely it's gonna create issues for you later on, especially with the IRS. And this one's a big one, is maintain clean financials. This ties back in with good record keeping or good bookkeeping. You know, don't be afraid to pay somebody a little, especially if you have a business. Now, if you don't have a business, then you don't have to worry about this as much, but pay somebody or consider hiring somebody to help you with your books. Who knows what they're doing? Somebody who's experienced and, and understands various scenarios. They should be asking you like, oh, what's your, what's your cash balance is? What's your balance sheet look like? What's your profit and loss look like? They, they should be able to help you go through your accounts and so when somebody's looking at them, like whether it's an accountant or CPA, or if somebody like the IRS is looking at it, or a banker, they can make sense really clearly of exactly what your assets are, what your liabilities are, and what your profit is. And if there's balances in the wrong places, and if there's negative amounts when there shouldn't be, which is very common uh, for people who don't have bookkeepers or who, not, who are unfamiliar with how financials works, then, uh, then it, it looks like the records are not well kept, which leads to opens the door for more issues if you catch my drift. So have, if you have a business, have somebody look over your financial records just to make sure, or pay somebody to train you how to do it. Uh, it's well worth the money in my opinion, so that you can keep your books tidy and so that you can easily prove your numbers if ever needed. Number 12, are your expense and deductions reasonable? What do I mean? Now this ties back once again, if you have a, a business type of operation, the IRS, with their database of millions of taxpayers, their computer system actually will look at your type of filing. So if you have, let's say you're a plumber, for example, and you've been reporting that on Schedule C because you're a sole proprietor running your plumbing business. The IRS computer system and database has records of all the plumbers that have filed. And if they notice, for example, like your, your auto expense or your meal expense, is dramatically over the averages when taken all into account of all the different uh, taxpayers who are plumbers, their computer systems is going to trigger trigger a potential notice or an indicator for the IRS agent to potentially look at auditing you. And that's, it's known as a, uh, I wrote it down here as this is a, it's known as a discriminant, discriminant function test is what that is. And that's a method they do use to look at numbers and make sure they're reasonable based on industry averages so that no one person is dramatically over deducting certain expenses when maybe they shouldn't be. Maybe maybe that deduction is not legitimate and that the, their computer system can cue them in on, on those types of issues. Number 13, once again, it deals with records and it's really about keeping them clean and organized. And I mean just like organization in the sense of you can quickly and easily access your records because what it does is if you are ever selected for audit, you look so professional. You look like you're on top of your game. If you can say, oh yeah, you need that? Huh, I'll find that for you. And then like one minute later, you have the response to the auditor. They will be blown away because that's not what they're used to. And when they work with somebody who's got their stuff together, then they're probably not gonna hammer you as hard. They're probably gonna say, oh, okay, well then, um, this person can easily prove their expenses. I don't need to dig into this as much. It's probably fine as is. So remember when you were in school and you had a homework assignment or a book report or a large project and your teacher asked you, you know, turn your homework assignment nice and neat. So for example, so like when I do my own taxes, I keep them in one separate folder for each year. So in this one folder, I just have exactly what I need and everything in here is exactly uh, matches back to what's on the return. All the proof is right here, very neatly organized, tied off, and I can find this within a minute. And so this is the kind of organization you want when it comes to your, your records. Now notice, you know, I don't have hundreds of receipts on this, but there's 1099s in this instance. Now for my, for my business, which I operate now as for my accounting practice, 
all my receipts are digital. So I have copies of virtually every receipt I've expensed so far for the year in my computer database. And it's all organized by the account type. And so if it's a meal expense, I can easily find that receipt within a matter of a minute. If it's something else, another type of expense, supplies, I can just find it very quickly. I have very organized in my computer database and it's backed up. And, and so doing it that way electronically is totally fine as well. Number 14 really deals with taking cash payments. Now, cash has been a big thing in society for a long time. And clearly as we have these different cash apps like Venmo, um, Zelle and some of these other ones, you know, people are uh, more routinely paying each other with those type of apps. And of course, you know, there's, as you've heard, there's the new 1099 filing requirements that those companies are gonna be issuing to the users for certain types of transactions over $600. In the past, they didn't do that. But with cash transactions in general, if you're receiving large checks or cutting large checks in excess of $10,000, that creates a special reporting requirement for the banks and the banks are required then to also be reporting. I, I'm pretty sure they are required to report that information to the IRS as well. And if the IRS sees some really large cash payments going out of your, in and out of your accounts on a routine basis, then they may start to suspect, even though even though you're not doing it, hopefully you're not doing it, uh, money laundering. And so that that can queue up an audit right there if they see all these large cash transactions taking place. So just be aware of that. And if you do have to engage in a business where it's primarily cash based, make sure you have all the records and receipts to prove what you're doing. Lastly, if you have payroll and you have employees, then you have payroll filing requirements. There's quarterly payroll filings to be done to make sure they're prepared timely. And if you need help doing that, make sure you get in contact with somebody who can help you with that because the not issuing payroll is a death sentence to a business. Like if you're, if you're not withholding the proper amount and remitting it to the IRS timely and, and including the state as well, if you're to the income tax state, then you could face severe penalties. I mean, very severe. I mean, we're talking like tens of thousands of dollars in penalties enough to bankrupt most businesses. And so that's, so there, you know, you think not filing your tax return is bad. Try not filing your payroll returns and you're, you're remitting your withholding timely that will bankrupt your business in no time flat. If you just go about the, your process, um, be, have good records, be organized and file things timely. For the most part, you are going to decrease your chance of audit by like 90 something percent just by doing those simple things. And the rest of it is just, you know, just being uh, prepared. If you ever do get selected for audit, I, I do think that there's going to be a lot of new audits and especially with all these new agents coming on board. And you know, the, a lot of people are saying they're going to target them in a class. And I do believe, I do believe that because the, the billionaires and the very, very rich people, they've had auditors in their offices for years. And so these big companies, I assure you, they're all, they've already been audited or they're, they're already highly scrutinized by the IRS to make sure their, their accounting procedures are followed properly. So I think the, what they're going to do is they're going to move on down the line. Now, obviously the more money you make, the more likely you are to get audited. Absolutely. The more money you make, the more likely you are to get audited. So, I mean, if you're hardly making anything, you're probably fine. You're probably not going to get selected, but, but just if you're a small business owner though, I think that's who they're going to be targeting. There's a lot of small business owners who do not follow the rules and they're going to subject themselves or open, expose themselves to potential audits with the amount of staff the IRS is going to bring on before they really couldn't do it. They don't really have the staff. I mean, the IRS hasn't even been able to answer my phone calls on the professional hotline. And so they really haven't had a chance to, to audit as many people as they hope to, but now they're going to be able to, or at least a lot more. And so just by following these practices, procedures, you're going to do yourself a big favor and save yourself a lot of time. Because with an audit, even if you win an audit, which is known as a no change audit, it's still to your detriment. It still doesn't feel like a win because one, you've had to dedicate a lot of your time and resources to focusing on the audit instead of you being able to actually go out and make money in your business or you know whatever you're doing in your life. And secondly, if you pay somebody like a CPA, like myself to do it, it's expensive. Like it's, it's costly, it's a lot of time. And I can tell you CPAs don't like doing this. CPAs would rather not deal with audits. It's, a, it's no fun because it's not like, I don't feel if I'm helping a client with an audit, 
um, which I did at a, a firm I used to work at, I don't feel like I'm adding any value to them. I mean, it's just frustrating. It's just, it's like, here's all the records, here you go. Um, it's like, what else do you wanna see? And so, you know, in that case, there was, uh, for that one, there was a, a, it was a no change audit for the most part, um, which was which was great. But it's still, I mean, it was it took probably like 20 to 30 hours of my time to conduct, to help, to be part of that audit and find everything the auditor needed. So you can see that it is very, very costly for the taxpayer and they're not they're not talking about that and it's really unfortunate so these are things you can do to protect yourself i hope it helps looking for professional accounting help with your accounting records your books your tax returns or other matters you can reach me at my website at www.mikekellycpa.com go to the contact section and fill out my intake form and check in with me to see if i'm accepting new clients and i will be in touch with you soon Make sure you subscribe to the channel because I'm going to have a video coming out on record keeping. That's one of the, the, the um, upcoming videos I'll be working on, including updates on the uh, the new bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. And I'll be making content around that. And uh, stay tuned for more videos, guys. So until then, I'll see you in the comments. Have a wonderful week and thanks for watching. Peace.